We can see that the Earth's crust is subdivided into plates whose relative motions are well known. How these motions are powered is a question that is open to debate. Convectional potential can only account for 4% of the total crust energy expenditure. We would also expect to find the hottest areas in the mid-ocean ridges and the lowest in the subduction zones, but what we actually find is the opposite of this. Deformation from tidal forces is another possibility to supply energy to this process, but this only supplies 0.01% of the energy consumed in tectonic friction. Recent research has found a wide variety of evidence that electric and magnetic fields are associated with tidal and seismic deformation, though the origins of these is still unknown. Let's explore Charles Chandler's concept of electronic tectonics and how it might be able to answer some of these fundamental questions about how our crust operates. Plate tectonics theory is widely accepted, but as we stated in the opening, the driving force for this motion is open to speculation. Currently, the definition of this force is that when new crust forms at mid-ocean ridges, the oceanic lithosphere is initially less dense than the underlying asthenosphere. But it becomes dense with age as it conductively cools and thickens. The greater density of the old lithosphere relative to the underlying asthenosphere allows it to sink into the deep mantle at subduction zones, providing most of the driving force for the plate motion. The problem with this is that it would mean that the heat loss from the plates should be highest at the mid-ocean ridges, and gradually reduce as you move away and reach its lowest value in the trench regions, and as we have already stated, we actually find the opposite. With the coolest, heaviest rock rising in the mid-ocean ridges, and the hottest, most buoyant rock sinking back into the mantle. This is clearly not a simple convection system. So what could power this if we are ruling out internal heat and tidal forces? Electromagnetism. At sufficient pressure deep inside the Earth, rocks get ionized. At the atomic level, electrons can only exist as free particles or in specific shells, and if atoms are pushed too close together, these shells fail, thus releasing the electrons as free particles. If the pressure is relaxed, the electrons will be drawn back to the positive ions by the electric force. If the pressure is static, the charge separation is stable, with positive ions deeper than the threshold for compressive ionization, and negative ions above it. But if the pressure changes, electrons will flow out of the matter as pressure increases and back in when it decreases. What could cause these pressure changes? One possible mechanism to consider is that of tidal forces. This can cause the crust to be raised or lowered by about 11 centimeters every day, and this would change the pressure on the underlying rocks, which in turn would vary the degree of ionization. At low tide, the electrons would be forced upwards by the pressure, and at high tide, the electrons would flow back down to recombine with the positive ions. So do we know that this actually happens? We know that elements heavier than hydrogen have degrees of ionization. The greater the pressure, the greater the number of electrons that can be expelled. We do know that in the transition from a rigid lithosphere to the plastic asthenosphere, ionization has already begun, since the removal of valence electrons weakens the crystal lattice, allowing the rocks to flow instead of fracturing. In the lower lithosphere, we can expect rocks to be partially ionized, but with enough valence electrons to support rigidity. So what would be the observed effects of this process? At high tide, the crust is elevated, reducing the pressure on the mantle. With less pressure, there is less ionization, so electrons flow back in. Telluric currents associated with tides are well known. These are normally attributed to the flow of water itself and no specific study of inland tidal ionization has been carried out. But, an interesting indirect measure of this phenomena might have been found in a study of lightning in North Dakota. In 10 years of data, the cloud to ground strike rate average is 22% greater at high tide, which was statistically more significant than the other factors normally associated with lightning induction.
Since 85% of all cloud to ground strikes are from a negative charge in the cloud to a positive charge on the ground, this suggests that the ground had a stronger positive charge at high tide. And indeed, if the surface is elevated, the pressure underneath is relaxed, allowing charge recombination and thus a downward flow of electrons, leaving the surface positively charged. Another case to consider is that of crustal deformation in subduction zones. As the ocean plate is forced under a continental plate, we can see that there must be an increase in pressure in these zones. This movement can cause buckling of the plates. As the ocean plate becomes thinner, this buckling is more likely to occur closer to the fault. The continental plate has nothing above, so it will buckle upwards, and this is what causes groundwater levels to change in the days before a quake. When the fault ruptures, the buckle flattens out again, with the leading edge of the continental plate advancing over the oceanic plate, like an inchworm moving forwards as it straightens out. Before and during the earthquake, there are distinctive signs of electromagnetism, including changes in the electric field, corona discharge, which we see as earthquake lights, and perturbations in the Earth's magnetic field. These are all attributed to the piezo effect. Certain types of crystals become electric dipoles under pressure. The problem is that this dipole field does not extend much beyond the crystal itself. Add into this the fact that the crystals are randomly oriented, meaning that the effect from individual crystals should cancel each other out. Yet compressive ionization can occur in any matter. In this model, the buckling of the crust reduces the pressure exerted on the underlying rock, enabling recombination, which in itself will require a current to flow towards this material. This effect will be far more dramatic than that of tidal deformation. Here, crustal displacement can cause changes of several meters rather than centimeters. Now you might argue that rocks are resistant to the flow of current, so none of this matters anyway. Solid granite has a resistance of 2.4 mega ohms, which is too large to allow a current to flow, but the fracturing on the buckled crust makes it a much better conductor. A crack of only one nanometer wide is enough to allow the passage of electrons and the resistance drops to roughly 400 ohms, allowing current to flow at much lower voltages. So what ultimately causes the earthquake? It is commonly believed that the buckled crust is elastic. If this were true, it would be able to store energy that could be released catastrophically when the traction failed along the fault. What we find is that under stresses sufficient to cause buckling, the rigid crust fractures, which is an irreversible deformation that stores no energy. Without elasticity, a buckled crust shouldn't produce an earthquake. The buckle should just become a permanent geological feature possibly growing over a longer period of time into something resembling the Appalachian Mountains. Some have argued that the uplifted rock has converted pressure into gravitational potential that gets released catastrophically. But if gravity was powerful enough to generate a megathrust fault, just because the crust was elevated a few meters, mountain ranges 5,000 meters high within 250 kilometers of a trench would be quite impossible. Since we know earthquakes occur and mountains exist, we can only conclude that the kinetic energy of colliding plates isn't stored and then released catastrophically since there is no suitable storage mechanism. Rather, the plate collision can only be releasing some other form of potential energy. In part two, we will explore how this process of compressive ionization may hold the key not only to explaining earthquakes, but also how and why the plates are actually moving. If you are new to this channel, then welcome, and please consider subscribing for more of this type of content. If you enjoyed this video, please consider leaving a like. You can also help to support me make this type of content through either PayPal or Patreon. And lastly, a massive thank you to all who have donated and all of my Patreon members. As always, be brave, be curious, the truth is waiting for us. Until next time.